what your guys' experience levels are. Um, and if you guys have any questions that um, I can write down and, and think upon while I do the class and then answer later if I don't answer it already. Um, so the first thing we're going to talk about is uh, check weapons check sizes um, and uh, different types of weapons check and the pros and cons of doing those weapons checks. Um, so that's going to give you kind of a perspective if those of you who have not attended very large weapons check or not hosted very large weapons checks or on the other spectrum have not hosted smaller ones or participated in smaller ones um, like day events or so. Um, I'm also going to talk about um, uh, what not to do and what to do to make your lives easier and everybody's lives easier as a checker and as a checkee. Uh, and that's going to actually be a, a big chunk of it. Um, and I got a lot of here's thing. And then I'm going to talk briefly uh, about something that I think is related, um, but mostly unrelated to the topic um, about rule changes. Um, and my personal philosophy on it and how to be open and being aware of uh, rule changes as they change, uh, because keeping your ear to the ground um, is going to help you as a weapons checker and someone who's being checked. Um, and then yeah. after all that, I'm going to go back, I'm going to go downstairs in my garage where I've got all the weapons galore. Um, as well as my weapons check kits and I'll break into my weapons check kits and show you all the things that I use and I think are necessary for hosting a weapons check um, as well as uh, check all the weapon types. Okay. Cool. Um, so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to ask for your guys' name and experience level um, with weapons check. Um, does anybody want to volunteer to go first? Sure. Go. All right. My so, name is, and I have absolutely no weapon experience at all. Wonderful. That's, That's a good thing. That's a blank canvas. Anybody next? Uh, I'm Scar Roku. I've been playing since 2005 and have been head hero at all and national events. And I've weapons checked at most events that I have attended since... Oh boy, I have to play with math. Since about 2007, 2008. That's wonderful. Uh, I'm actually very, uh, well, I'm excited to have all you guys here, but I'm also very excited to have someone who has more experience with weapons check than I do. Um, partly because this is opinion based, I'm actually going to be looking to Oroku if you want to add on things additionally, sparingly, of course, because we, uh, we only have a limited amount of time. Um, feel free to add stuff on. Um, I only ask that. Um, if no like direct conflict so if you have any strict strong agree disagreements with uh, with my opinion i don't ask you to silence them um but let's not fight <laughs> you know what i mean um just for the time i'd love to have a conversation with you later if you and i have any disagreements on the topics okay um wonderful uh sprocket my name's sprocket um I've done a volunteer weapon check at Bifter, as well as a couple day events at a Corban uh, Potlucks. Wonderful, thank you. Um, does anybody else want to uh, add their name and their level of experience? No, okay. Um, so additionally, actually, because I forgot to ask it initially, um, is there any initial thoughts or questions that you guys have um, coming into the class. And we can go in order of how we did the names. Flo, do you have any thoughts or questions going into the class? Anything you expect to learn or um, would like to see? Um, now off the top of my mind, I, have, I do have plans for more like exotic designs to see if they're feasible once I start building. So I guess to know a weapons check on how to do an exotic would be really helpful. Nice. Um, just as a quick bit to that, that's actually something that I'm very, very interested in. Um, not necessarily the practicality of exotic weapons, but as far as a general philosophy, and we'll cover that later, um, about being open to um, weapons that are not like the standard. Um, and I think we'll actually delve into that a little bit and you might be pleasantly surprised. Um, Oroku, do you have any questions or something that you're looking forward to uh, learning about going into the class? It is always nice to hear other people's opinions. And then, of course, it's always nice to hear mine as well. 
Sprocket? No, sorry, I'm I'm messing with the thing. I'm trying to figure out how to mute myself. I apologize. Oh, I got you. No worries. Um, all right, let's get started then. Um, so the first thing that we're going to go over, um, there are plenty of different ways to do a weapons check. Um, two of the most notable ways that I have seen in my experience um, are doing, I guess, Roku, if you've known a better word for this, is uh, doing it in piles, where you're separating the weapons, and then you'll gather them in large piles, and then you'll have checkers um, check those piles um, is one way of checking them. I think that's a very common way to do it. It's actually my preference, but I won't show too much bias today. Um, a secondary one, um, not to diminish its quality, is a DMV-style check. Um, and that one, very simply, is... It's typically two people. It's the person getting it checked, going up to the person checking it, and they will check all of what they bring um, with rules and restrictions and stuff, typically. Um, so I'm going to give you guys kind of a, a, a look of what the piles look like for those of you who have not done it. Um, typically, if you are a check E, you will approach your weapons check and you will see piles of weapons that will be appropriately categorized. Um, you'll see Blues, typically. Um, reds, greens only. You'll see projectiles. These are typically going to include your javelins and your rucks. Um, and then you will see archery. And those, uh, in some cases, are combined into one department. And we'll get over the pros here on that. Um, but you'll typically see a pile of those might be similarly placed. Um, and then archery, um, which will, um, in most cases, I've seen, I've seen them kind of done similarly regardless if it's piles or if it's a DMV check. And, and we'll go over that. Um, for a DMV style, sorry, let's go over. If there's anything else that we'll see in a pile check, um, typically you'll see one station also um, that will handle failing weapons. Um, we'll often call this the impound. Um, if people are instilling an impound um, where they will hold failing weapons, typically and most commonly arrows, um, because they can be very dangerous if failing arrows specifically um, end up on the field. Um, and also, if the weapons checker is including them, you'll see an impound for other weapon types as well, because they are also dangerous if they end up on the field. Um, and these impounds will typically be held so nobody can come in um, unless they are uh, looking for something specifically and speak to an individual. This could be head weapons check, or this could be somebody who head weapons check is delegated to hold that position. Um, so those, uh, additionally, you will see piles for passing weapons. Um, that you can see after weapons have been checked so you can go and pick up. Um, they'll be tagged and we'll cover weapon tags and stuff um, in a little bit. Um, on the other hand, DMV style checks, you'll often see a line. The first thing you'll see uh, is um, because DMV style check is often a very one-on-one -on -one experience, um, there'll be people um, in line waiting for checkers to check their weapons. Um, so in this case, you won't necessarily see piles where people have just dropped off their stuff. And instead, you'll, you'll, um, um, you'll join a queue waiting for somebody to check your weapons. Now, of course, this one is expedited if there are, are more volunteers, but we'll cover briefly the pros and cons there. Um, with a, um, even with a DMV style check, you will still likely see an impound. And in my experience, I have often seen projectiles and on occasion, red weapons check also separated into different areas. So there's definitely hybridizations that you can do between these two styles, um, but these are the most common that I've seen. Does anybody have any questions so far about those two style weapons checks or any comments that they'd like to add? No, pretty clear cut that I paint a um, good visual. For, <laughs> Go for ahead. the piles, uh, how do you determine which one is specifically to which uh, warrior? Is it marked by like ad identification? Yeah, yeah, so that's actually a good question. And we'll actually bring up one of the cons of um, a pile check. Um, it's normally the responsibility of the individual to mark their gear so it is identifiable by that player. Um, 
there's a pro and a con between this. Um, there is a bias that exists within weapons checkers. Um, and even if you are aware of this bias, it's one of those things that are potentially internalized. Um, so if your weapon is very unique, or it is um, something that you use over and over again, people can identify that it's yours, but at the same time, you're able to identify it. You can also identify them by adding like, yeah, exactly. It, I see that weapon specifically on our field often. So if I saw it in weapons check, I would know whose it is and whose it belongs to. More importantly, you know who it belongs to. To, to do this, I recommend adding your name um, because a con of a weapons check like this is losing the weapon. Um, if that answered your question or didn't answer your question, I'd like to add one more additional note. Um, these piles are typically marked with some level of identification. Um, I'll show you mine when we go into the garage. I have like cutouts that have or laminated that have each thing. Um, so they should be pretty clear designated. Um, if they are not, or those cutouts or signs are not easily seen, it's typically because there's a cluster um, or like a backup of weapons, or there's a lot of people. Um, in that case, you can always ask, or you can identify, hey, this is where the shields are. Um, a good weapons check as a checker or someone hosting the check, you'll try to make it as clean as possible. And we're, of course, we're limited by our space, but yeah, let's try as clean and organized as possible because you don't want mix-ups. Did that answer your question? Wonderful. Does anybody have, have any comments or questions about um, identifying those two weapon check types? No? So let's go into those specifically a little bit, actually. Um, so depending on your event size, those actually might become problems. So for the piles at Battle for the Ring, there's actually kind of a very small, and this isn't talking poorly on Battle for the Ring. It's actually kind of a small area. So with an abundance of weapons in a small area, you're going to have a lot of congestion when it comes to weapons. Um, but this congestion is has its flaws on both sides. You're either congested with weapons or you're potentially congested with people. Um, and that can lead to a slowdown and a lot of confusion and chaos. So Try to, if you are doing this style, make sure that your weapons check area is large enough and organized enough to accommodate for that, um, either people or weapons um, in this situation. I recommend doing something like that in large events. I had good experiences when I did that for Bifter. Um, the only thing I would have changed is the size of the field, if I could. Um, that being said, if you have, you're dealing with a much smaller number of weapons at a smaller day event, I also find this to be a very effective way to do it. Um, DMV style checks um, are really neat because I find they're best done when you have a large number of qualified, dedicated volunteers. Because you're able to open up more lines of people who can expedite the process and are knowledgeable enough to be able to get it done. So if you have that, then that might be a better option for you depending on the size of event and the amount of staff that you have. Um, so let's get into, what is my next thing here? Pros and cons. So I'm gonna briefly talk about the, I talked a little bit about some of the pros and cons of those ones, but let's get a little bit more of them. So I actually listed one here on both of them. Um, I put faster or more efficient uh, on both of them, because this is one that as a general rule, a lot of people are gonna have a lot of different opinions on. Um, I think piles are faster, but in many ways, I think that um, DMV checks faster. Um, and there's a lot of different variables here that are going to expedite your process on those. Um, but if done effectively, both of them have a capacity to be very fast. Um, and I, I'll go through those right now. Um, for piles, um, a pro is that you'll have less lines, typically, um, which is both true and not true. Uh, I'm not lying to you because there's no actual lines. However, with um, piles, your lines will not be lines, but there'll be people standing around waiting. Um, so yeah. So they might not be lines of people waiting to get their things checked. They'll be kind of unorganized herds of people. That can be addressed by having somebody remove those people or reminding them that they can come back for their stuff. Um, but I overall think it's a pro if it's a, if it's actually addressed by somebody in the department um, to have less lines for this. Um, 
This is my favorite part of this is actually more volunteer opportunities. Um, when you do piles, there's a lot of areas that can be covered by people who have almost little to no experience with weapons check. And one of my favorite philosophies when it comes to Belagarth is the more we have these positions for people, um, it allows them to enter volunteering without feeling like the volunteering itself is overly daunting. Um, it's almost a very kind, welcoming, come volunteer, you'll learn, right? Um, and these positions can include people who run back and forth to take passing weapons or shields um, to an area in which people can can grab them. Um, that takes almost little to no experience. Um, and if you have one or two runners, it's a very good entry level thing for people who are, this is their first event, but they want to contribute some time, you know. Um, also, adding stickers or either passing stickers or in some cases failing stickers um, to weapons is also a very easy way to enter volunteering um, without it being very daunting. Um, while you're there, you gain more experience talking to other weapons checker. Is, and I actually think it's a very interesting social uh, experience as well as far as volunteering is concerned. That being said, those are also potentially a lot of unnecessary positions. You know what I mean? Uh, because with the DMV style check, and this is a pro for the DMV style check, um, if you have more, I would say that there's a requirement for more qualified individuals that can cover pretty much everything, but that means they're also either adding weapons, uh, checking stickers to the weapons or having the individuals or who are checking them, adding to them. Um, and a lot of those that busy work is actually going to be passed on to these more qualified checkers potentially, um, which actually might slow down the process even more so. Um, and again, this is a situation that could be remedied by more of these people, but you're now eliminating all of those more entry level volunteering positions um, and kind of, in my opinion, hogging some experience points that can be given to those people. But there's definitely different ways to look at that, I think. Uh, so as a pro for this as well, um, you will, as a, sorry. From the perspective of a head weapons check of the departments, um, you can actually have people cover more specific um, departments. Um, if you split up these things, you can have your head, you can have almost smaller heads of these departments. You can have somebody who is expressively uh, in charge of blue weapons uh, or red weapons or green weapons or archery. And I find that this is a very easy process as the head of the department to be able to more so delegate or manage those officers as opposed to kind of overseeing less specific departments. Um, this is also an additional position that can grant experience to certain people. And I'm, I'm pro giving an opportunity for people to learn. Um, so that's what I think is a benefit to that. That being said, you can always hybridize your DMV style and break it into more departments like archery, which I have seen, or like red, which I have seen. Um, so that's not explicitly um, piles specific. Um, the cons, and I briefly went over this. This style requires a lot more of volunteers that don't necessarily have to exist. Um, if you are in a position where there isn't as many volunteers as you need for an event, um, or like a large scale event, then this actually can be like a really big vacuum for volunteer work. People might have uh, come to your weapons check and done a very small role for maybe 20 minutes, maybe an hour, maybe even less than that, and feel, and this is potentially contested, but they might feel satisfied in a way that they've already contributed and therefore not volunteer in other positions throughout the event. Um, so these openings for volunteers could actually end up costing other departments, um, which I've worried about in the past. And uh, it's definitely something that you need to have your ear to the ground a little bit more. If you, in this situation, have far too many volunteers, I think as a weapons checker, um, or maybe head of that department, to cut people loose and to maybe micromanage and go, hey, you know, we got a lot of help here. Um, your weapons are checked. Head on over to the field, dude. I'll see you later. Or maybe come back tomorrow. You know what I mean? And, and that's a con in a way, because that adds an additional step that the weapons checker leaders um, are going to have to handle. Everybody understand? Um, 
Oh, oh the, a big one, a really okay. big one as far as a flaw for piles. I'm going to drink a thing of water really quick. Not a whole one, but. Lost weapons. Now, yeah. lost weapons are a big one. Um, yeah. When you ask the people who are having their weapons checked to relinquish their weapons into various piles, you're now in a way assuming the responsibility of their weapons um, as, a, as a head of your department. Um, and even if necessarily the event doesn't take a stance um, where they feel like you were responsible, people are still going to feel that you're responsible for their weapons. Does that make sense? Um, and this, this could be incredibly stressful um, for everybody. Um, losing your weapon could mean that your event is ruined. It could have been first day. It could have been the morning of the first day and you already lost your favorite bat. Um, so this, if not being careful, it could really cost somebody their event. Um, and a potentially passing weapon didn't get passed because it doesn't exist anymore. Or it's an additional headache for you or the person. Um, this is a tough remedy. Um, personally, I am pro marking your weapons like I had covered recently. Um, there are several ways you could do that. There are iron, there are iron on, basically iron on paper, and I'll find that and I'll link it to the chat, where you can actually uh, fix it to your weapon cover um, or even the pommel um, and write it on. Um, or you can write it on your pommel, or you can do specific covers. I always make my weapons, so long as they're not spears, with yellow covers. Um, that's something that helps me both, as an aside, combatively. Yes, Oroku. So one thing that I moved to in archery, and I actually did it at Battle for the Ring, is that yes. all of failing arrows get tagged and you get them back. You get them back. People were sick of losing arrows, not knowing mm. when impound was released. I decided, you know what? We are going to keep you in possession of your weapons, but we are going to start a tagging system so you know it is wrong and that we know that we checked them and that they have failed and we're not going to be responsible for them anymore. And I believe that, that has been highly successful um, in far as ensuring that people's gear doesn't walk off. Yeah, um, I think that that's actually, it's it's really smart, I think, especially for arrows. Uh, we have some bifter arrows downstairs in the garage that haven't found homes. Um, could I get whoever's mic is on to turn off temporarily, just so we can get the background noise going? Maybe it's Brocken. I think I could do it. All right, taken care of. Um, sorry, we actually have some best for arrows downstairs that have the big old tag on them. And I think that that's a cool one. Um, uh, arrows are very, they're smaller than weapons are for one thing. Um, and they can, they all pretty much look the same other than the little tip on the top. Um, so yeah, I, I really like that. And I also think that it actually says something about individual departments being able to make decisions based on what they're experiencing. So that sounds like a great Thing that decision that you made. Um, in that case, were you the like a department head for archery, or just a volunteer? Or? No, I was. I was. I was head that year, and I nice. was really sick of people arguing about it because arrows kept going missing through the impound process, and they didn't want their mm -hmm. gear, their very expensive gear, to be kept somewhere, and yeah. not having them. But I had to ensure reasonable, reasonable safety on the field. So that's what I ended up doing, and. Uh, it's been adopted in several other large events. Um, and if we have uh, time to chat at the end, I will, I'll, I'll kind of mention some other stuff too. But Wonderful. I'm excited to hear it. Um, yeah. Super neat. Um, that's another thing too. If you are a weapons checker, especially if you are in a position in which you are um, able to make that call and you see something that needs to be adjusted, I, I recommend it. Or if you don't feel quite comfortable with it, make it quick. Make us uh, like a get a second opinion, or ask head weapons check at that point. Be like, hey, I think this could be done more effectively. And oftentimes, people can be receptive of that. If it's not even that year, it could be the next time that it happens. Um, so, so yeah. If you see something similar to a Roku and you have to make that call, ask somebody or make that call. Um, lost weapons still. It said. I do my weapons with all yellow covers. Um, you know what? I figured out why there's an echo.
sorry about that. So I do all of mine with weapon, uh, weapons with yellow covers. That helps me with multiple different reasons, but it also helps me identify that those are my weapons. Um, if you have a specific fabric that you like or a pattern, or maybe you mark all of your weapons with, uh, I don't know, a blue mark, blue thing of tape around the handle or something, which is both convenient for the fact that it's a blue weapon in most cases, but also that you can quickly and easily identify your stuff. That's going to benefit you in the long run. Also, giving an identifier additionally to that will help if your weapon does turn up missing. Um, either the person who potentially stole it, I'm not saying that that's really even something that potentially could happen, um, but the people who have checked the weapons might have noticed that one key feature of, hey, wait, I think I do remember that in a sea of you know all black bats with nylon socks over them, your weapon could have actually been able to be found just by that one defining feature. Um, so this is not something that you as the weapons checker can really instill on people at that moment, um, but you as a check E can make that become more of a simpler process for them or for you, Ethan. Um, does anybody have any questions about any of the pros or cons for piles or comments, things that they would also like to add? Yes, sir. Okay. The one thing with piles, and this was specifically at a BFTR that I noticed, is the issue with piles is if it rains, you end up with weapons in a pile of mud. If you put down tarps, the rain is captured in the tarp, and you end up with weapons in water. This, like that, that was just, yeah, not a fan. Um, and like, there was nothing you could do with the piles. There, there wasn't. There was, there was no way that you could keep weapons out of water, mud, or anything like that, unless, you know, people were immediately there to take care of their weapons. Yeah, I think that's a, a fantastic point and actually something I had not considered. Um, it wasn't an issue that I ended up facing and most, I, I live in California. A lot of this is going to be from Southern California. And most of the time our weather is pretty darn good. After it does rain um, because of the, the season. Um, but that's a fantastic point. If you are in a situation where you have inclement weather um, or you might see an issue of rain, it's, it's a very hard issue to handle, especially if you do piles. Um, weapons that become wet become nearly impossible to check. Um, most weapon materials are not waterproof. Um, and if you're going to hit yourself with a wet weapon, it does change the hit factor. It, ch it changes a lot of things and actually makes them very difficult to check. Um, so yeah, from personal perspective, I had a lot of success with piles, but I've also never faced that issue specifically in the times that I've done it. Um, so if you are from an area that is, you know, maybe a no go because you might face that or, or be keen on what the weather's looking like so you can make adjustments if you do go with that, that style. Um, fantastic point, Roku. thank you. Does anyone else have any comments of pros, cons, um, or additions that they would like to add? Questions? No? Okay, let me look at my outline real quick and let's go over um, pros and cons of DMV style. So, here is the pros and cons of DMV style that I think. Um, so pro, I said it before, faster. Um, if done correctly, I think the DMV styles are very, very fast, especially if it's a, a smaller event or maybe more of, I've seen a lot of success in a medium sized event um, where it might be a more, more casual experience with less weapons and less people waiting in line, um, especially if your area is large enough to accommodate people waiting in line, or if you have some sort of background activity like music going on, um, which is sometimes difficult in events that are, are earlier in the morning. You don't want to be blasting music or something, um, but something to occupy the time of people waiting in line. You'll see businesses do this with music and like waiting music or, or, or things to look at while you're doing it. That might not be an option that you can, you can do. Um, but yeah, it's potentially really fast and you get less complaints typically if people are waiting in line on this situation. Um, so long as you have proper accommodation. One of my favorite, things about DMV style checks are people know why weapons fail immediately. Um, if you have someone in front of you checking your weapons, they can tell you, hey, this fails because of this. And that communication happens right then instead of potentially if you dropped off your weapon, picked it up and there's a sticker on it that says this fails for scribbly line that you can barely read in some cases, there's going to be a position that you're going to feel as a checker or sorry, as a person who just got their weapons checked, um, and this is more so, I guess, a con for the the, the pile thing, um, of feeling that you were treated unfairly. You don't know exactly why this fails right then and there, and you no longer have an opportunity to fix something that could have been potentially incredibly minor. And we'll go over that too um, in the future. So um, 
uh, I'll hold on to that. Um, but yeah, people know why they fail immediately. And that's something that actually gets transferred and is my favorite part of DMV style checks is I know exactly why I'm it's clear, I don't have any doubt. And if I do have any doubt, let's say maybe I do know the rule specifically and it changed and this checker doesn't know, I can very respectfully and you know without any aggression, um, say, hey, you know, actually, uh, I think that rule is phrased like this. Um, and Book of War will most likely be handy, and I'll list that in our um, our lines. And that can be cleared up right then and there. Um, I'm going to give an example of one of my favorite things that had happened. It actually happened at a pile, um, like a pile style check, but it's very reminiscent of like a DMV style check. We had someone who came up with a weapon, and it was single edged. It had kind of like a haft or like a, pat, a padding, a safety padding over the front of it, but it was it was single edged and it was the same color on both ends. And in our game, you need 12 inches, and correct me if I'm wrong, potentially, potentially wrong, uh, but you need 12 inches of contrasting tape or in oftentimes people, if they wanna get fancy, they'll use fabric um, in their fabric cover um, in order to differentiate between the two. This was an issue that if that person had just put it in check and they didn't come to it, that would have just been thrown in a fail pile. How quickly can you add a and, and and actually as an addition, there were people who were conflicted about this weapons checker and actually took a lot of time and actually got a little heated because they were unsure about if this is going to be an issue because it was actually a short weapon. So it wasn't even, I, if I remember correctly, it was like 12 inches on the nose or something. Um, so this problem was very easily fixed by adding a piece of tape on the back of it. It was very easy. Um, and that's something that was adjusted very quickly. And if it was done in a, 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 like a DMV style, you'd be like, hey, this fails for this reason, but guess what? I have tape right there. Bam, five seconds, you're done and you're back on the field. And this is where the personal, like the one-on-one -on -one experience of a DMV weapons deck, I think shines, is the ability to adjust very simple things that otherwise could have been a lot larger problem by taking that additional time face-to-face. There is a remedy to that and I'll cover it a little bit. Um, but yeah, that's my favorite pro of that. Um, because of, and I had mentioned this before, a DMV style check runs more effectively when there are experienced and knowledgeable people at the checkers. If you have somebody who is maybe, um, yeah, if you have a line of people who are very well versed in the Book of War, um, they're able to quickly and more effectively get these things done. Um, so it's a potentially better filter for failing weapons instead of it being in a pile. I actually think sometimes if you put a failing weapon in a pile, there's odds that it's gonna make it through that pile. Um, and that's because it's just thrown in with a lot of other things. And if it goes through the hands of somebody who's maybe less experienced, they might let that weapon pass through in something like a pile check. But if a DMV style check is in place and somebody who is more experienced is checking all of these things and inspecting them over and over again, this person is a better filter based on their experience level in order to make sure that these weapons are actually passing and nothing slips through. Now, I'm going to talk about the cons for, um, oh, yeah, and then I'll ask questions after this. I'm going to talk about some of the cons of a DMV style weapons check. So some of the cons are long lines. So at a pile style check, people can just walk by and place their items in designated piles and walk away and accomplish more things. This can be done by a lot of people who, in a lot of my personal experience, are the staff or the people who are at that moment disposed of. Um, and they can just place things in pile, walk away. I can't tell you how many times I, I grabbed Ana's stuff for DMV style for a Battle for the Ring because Ana still loves fighting and she's heading the event and she doesn't have time to go through weapons check. So this makes it very easy for me to grab stuff and be able to place it in piles. Um, and then those people finish the things that they're going to do. This can be abused, however. And that's why I think that the con there's an additional con of DMV style checks. When the lines get shorter, their reason is not because there's less weapons. It's because one person is doing a large sum of the weapons for their group. Now, if you have one person who is doing that, that's cool. Who wants to do it, that's cool. However, this role can be in a position, this role could be a position where they are being bullied by their, their group. That's not necessarily something that you can fix, but I guess in some ways you can. 
uh, awareness. But this person could potentially just be somebody who's maybe was asked by the rest of their camp or their unit to do it. They're carrying all of the their camp stuff and waiting in line with a big old pile of, of stuff waiting in line because nobody wants, you know, want three of the same people waiting in line. Why would they do that? They're friends. So they're going to get one person to, to do that. Um, so that's what I've seen a lot of weapon style checks. And the problem with this is communication between that person who's getting their weapons check, who just effectively communicated with the DMV checker, does not effectively get communicated with the people who just gave them their gear. They'll go back to camp, they'll drop all their gear right in the middle of camp. And I'm not saying this happens in every single situation, but the ones that I've seen, they'll go and they'll take all the gear that they just got as their camp gear taker. They'll drop it back in camp and the weapons that were failing, that one-on-one -on -one didn't happen necessarily with that person. I have, in my experience with DMV style checks, taken a weapon that was failing off the field every single time. I mean, granted, that's only been three times, but every single time I've had that happen. And in some cases, multiple times where I've had uh, more times picking failing weapons off of the field because the person who had dropped off with their buddy their buddy didn't communicate effectively with them. Now, this can be remedied, of course, by adding additional failing tags. This could be remedied by limiting the number of weapons that can be brought. These are all restrictions that can be added. They're not necessarily very easy to enforce, um, but if you consider these as part of your systems, you might be able to avoid those things in, in a DMV style check. Um, I covered this briefly, but skilled volunteers as a DMV style weapons check as well. If you have skilled volunteers or people who are dedicated to do those positions, um, they will, well, you're limited to the pool of people who are willing to be dedicated skilled volunteers. Um, if you have one person who's skilled watching over a pile of weapons and can oversee and delegate smaller numbers of people who are less experienced, those, those people can ask this person. Um, with the requirement of having skilled volunteers, though you could still remedy it by having somebody who's overseeing those DMV checkers. Um, you need you need those people, and those people don't always exist. Um, if it's a larger event, you might have access to you know five people to to, to run windows, um, or maybe more people to rotate. That is an extra step that is often required, and I recommend required. Um, to do prior to the event, um, which adds a little bit more to your planning stage. Um, but I think in that case is necessary, or you're going to end up in a situation where you don't have as many windows or you have less skilled volunteers in those windows, um, which in the case of a pile check could mean that there was, a, it, there's actually less of a filter because one person who is potentially less experienced is checking a lot more uh, weapons. Um, so, so those are my thoughts on the, the cons of and pros of uh, DMV style weapons check. Is there anybody that would like to add additional comments, um, concerns, or questions about any of my opinions there on weapons check? You all agree with me or disagree with me? Thumbs up, thumb down. Oroku, what do you think? No, I mean, I of course have my opinions, but you stated very well the pros and cons of those checks. Nice. Do you have anything to add? Yes, no? I mean, of course I do, but uh, <laughs> we, can save, we can save it for the end of the video. <laughs> okay, that's good with me. Um, so uh, today we're going to, uh, for the next thing we're going to do is we're going to talk about um, some what not to do's and what to do's as a checker or sorry, as a check E and then a checker. And I'm actually going to give you some anecdotes here. Um, they won't be long winded. They'll be short. And I won't include names and stuff because some of them are more of like question, not questionable, but more of like whatever. Um, but what not to do and what to do as a check -y. These This will hopefully uh, add some additional things to consider when you're having your stuff checked um, to more effectively and more efficiently get through the process. So as a check -y, People who are doing this for us are volunteers of the event. They are not being paid. I have never been to an event where a, a volunteers have been paid. They're being paid with satisfaction that they've contributed to their community. Um, Exposure. Uh, put, I mean, potentially, potentially the XP points is how I often see it um, or that satisfaction. Um, but they're not getting paid and it's not necessarily their job. And the <laughs> as a department head, um, if those people are rude to the people who are volunteering for me, they're either not going to come back or like as volunteers, they're not going to come back um, or they had a bad time 
um, which ultimately will lead to less volunteers or a bad tasting to those mouths. We don't want that. Um, or it can mean more fires that you put out. Um, so please be kind to these people. They're, val they're volunteers. Um, I have seen this it, and I have experienced um, very rude people before. Um, and I, it's partly expected because remember, there's people are doing additional things and have additional uh, weapons check is typically in the morning. And if it's a weapons check that happens the day of or the day of for that person, they're going to come to you tired, sitting in a car ride for a long time. They don't want to be a weapons check. They want to go fight. They want to go hang out with their friends. Um, There's so many different factors that go into this so that both the checker and the checkee need to consider. And as a checkee, you need to consider, and I want you to do this, anytime that you're in a bad mood or that you are feeling that um, maybe you're not up to, to, to your level of, of um, like conscious okayness, right? Imagine the weapons checker is in the same boat as you, okay? Everyone's kind of fighting their own battle and you can't see it. Um, so that they're there in front of you. I want, if you're angry, I want you to think this person is potentially just as angry with me and it's not necessarily their job to handle my emotions. Um, if you are feeling that way and you cannot talk to people or handle that interaction with people, find a friend, talk to your head weapons checker or something, and, or, or, you know, another person, it could be of another department, someone you trust, and ask them to do you a solid. If that's not the case, there's typically event ambassadors, or even head weapons check. Be clear, be communicative, or come back later. Um, oftentimes, your realm, I know we do it in my realm, we offer loaner gear. So if you don't feel like you're going to check and you're going to have a positive experience, um, you ask to borrow somebody else's gear. Typically, your realm will provide that um, or members of your realm. <sighs> so is everybody clear on that? That vol they're volunteers? Be cool. Um, impatience is a very common thing in weapons check. Um, people are going to be impatient, um, but I want you to not be as just remember that, that you are expected to be a little impatient. Everybody around you is going to, to, to be a little frustrated. Um, yeah, and, and generally, I think the rule here is for both people is to don't be, don't be a jerk. Um, that's a little difficult when you're experiencing these additional emotions that you're feeling based on um, the difficulty of the situation. Um, but being clear and communicative, even in like customer service jobs, I bet those of you at home here or who talk to people for a living understand that you're going to get people on a bad day and you could have a bad day and it could affect that communicative. Remember that you guys have a goal here and both of you are there to satisfy that goal. Um, so here, something don't, to not do. Please don't bring failing weapons to weapons check. If you know it fails, or if you think that it's going to fail for something, get a second opinion from one of your friends or use better judgment and either try to remedy it or fix it before it goes into weapons check or uh, don't bring it. That's, that's the bottom line. If you know it fails, it will fail weapons check. And if it passes weapons check, it doesn't mean it didn't fail. It means if you know it fails and it passed, it still fails. And now you have a responsibility and weapons check at this point has a responsibility of that weapon entering the field. Is that clear? Yeah. And, and sometimes you don't know. Sometimes you don't know exactly if your weapon fails or not. At that point, get a second opinion. It doesn't necessarily have to be a weapons checker. Or if you're about to drop a sword in a pile, you can casually go up to somebody who's checking and be like, hey, I think uh, there's a hole here. Is this hole too large? Is my weapon you think is going to fail? And if that's the case, don't drop it. In, don't drop it into check. You can you have time potentially to go remedy it again. If your realm, I know our realm does, has any loaners or stuff, you can go and do that instead of dropping off something that is failing into check. Um, are we all clear? Cool. So I have an example actually of a comical thing that I did that maybe wasn't a good call, um, but in this situation was ended up being kind of a fun experience for, for people. I made a flail um, with my friend that was not a flail. It was a piece of foam and it had a rope attached to it. And there was a piece of PVC that it was slid through and knotted on the end. And guess what? That was it. It was, there was no dingleberries. There was no cover. There was no pommel. There was no nothing. This weapon was in my weapons bag and it was dropped off at check. This weapon was... I don't recommend doing this because, again, it breaks the rule that I just established. Don't drop off failing weapons to check. 
this was actually an interesting example because it was a slower weapons check day with a smaller event. The person who was checking this weapon saw this, or the, the head of that department of blues, saw this weapon and was able to mark uh, quite comically, actually, on a, a failing sticker, every single thing that this weapon failed for. And in that case, it was, you know, no pommel, uh, no padding on the chain, no cover, no, no, nothing, right? Um, so this has actually ended up being kind of a fun learning experience for those at check to learn additionally what to check for. Um, also comical. Um, I'm sharing you with this antidote not for you guys to go and do the same thing. Um, but as a, a kind of an additional filler to, to, to this topic. Um, yeah. Um, so <laughs> this is one that I experienced um, at one point. Actually, it's happened twice. Um, but somebody had their weapon fail for hit. And it was failing for hit um, in this situation, likely because it had additional tape or the poundage of the foam that was used was a little dense and it failed for hit. Um, I have heard of people who have made their weapon pass by leaving it out in the sun. Um, but something that I saw was somebody hitting their weapon against hard objects um, like trees um, or like a table. Um, now, there is a difference between trying to break in a new weapon, which we as builders have seen as, you know, potentially needed when they start off stiff, um, and damaging your weapon in attempt to very quickly make it pass check. If you are in a situation where you have to do something risky to your sword in a way, sword or, or spear or whatever red, in a way to pass your weapon, I advise don't do it. Um, find somebody else who can lend you a weapon. Um, if you're going to have to do something that's going to risk compromising the structure of your weapon, it's either not worth it because you just built that sword or you just bought that sword, um, or um, you're just going to be delaying an inevitability by creating new points of that weapon that are going to fail in the future. And if you're hitting a tree with it or you're hitting a table with your sword or something, you're going to create dead spots um, or break the foam. Um, so that's something I would advise against um, if you are a uh, check E. Don't break your stuff in an attempt to make it pass. Um, there are other simpler ways around it, even if that means borrowing one from somebody else. Um, we touched on it briefly with the uh, DMV style cons. If you are bringing stuff for other people or collecting failing stuff for other people, be clear and communicative with the people that you are doing that for. Um, additionally, don't be bullied by people to do that. Uh, it might be a kind thing, but you do not have to do that for other people. Um, but yeah, if you're bringing stuff for other people, please be communicative. If you grab something and it failed, don't remove failing stickers. Hand it to a person and say, hey, this failed for this. If you cannot find that person, remember it at the best of your ability. Um, if you take that to check, um, my philosophy is that you're assuming responsibility of the communication that happened with you to the person that that weapon belongs to. Um, that is something to consider as a checkie. If you are not willing to take on that responsibility of at least communicating the the you know the status of that weapon or what was told to you with the person don't 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 take their weapons to check don't do it um don't feel pressured into checking their weapons to check and don't don't do it um yeah as a checky um this kind of touches on hey i think my weapon's gonna fail don't go to your friends I said it right at the beginning, there's bias that exists. If you see that your friend is at a, at a weapons check pile, don't go to your friend and say, hey, buddy, that one's mine. Can you check that one? Um, and I'll cover this as a checker. But if you are going to try to use bias from your friends in order to pass things, I mean, you may as well have just checked it yourself. And that is a level of dishonesty um, that is, is not okay. Um, so try to go into it uh, without seeking bias. Um, I do think that there is maybe some degree where if you are bringing an exotic weapon into the pile um, and you are concerned that somebody might interpret the rules incorrectly, um, you might want to save that, maybe speak to a someone who you know is more experienced, they might be a friend of yours. Um, and this is a case that I have seen before where people have brought questionable things to check that were not questionable safety-wise, but they were questionable rule-wise. Um, and they wanted it interpreted in a fair way. And um, 
ultimately your goal as a checker, and I'm going to use this as a, as a segue into this, is to leave these people satisfied without sacrificing your energy or any of your moral convictions. So that doesn't mean, hey, this person's mad. They get their weapons check, their weapons passed, even if it's failed. And this doesn't mean, hey, this person's worried about their rules. Don't uh, just let it pass anyway. Uh, that's not okay. But ultimately, I think that that's rule two when people should consider about your core responsibility as a weapons checker. Number one is to ensure that the things that make it to the field are safe. And if they get hurt, it wasn't the weapon. But number two is leave them satisfied. Um, if you are letting people go through weapons check and they feel as if they are being treated unfairly, you'll hear about it. You'll hear about it, maybe not specifically from that one person, but they're going to talk to their friends. And there is an aside there about um, when somebody talks poorly against you in a circle that you do not have any representation in, it automatically inerts bias into that that circle against you. Um, and this could mean that there's extra fires to put out for the weapons checkers. Um, but yeah, so if you're not clear and communicative as a checker with these people, um, then it could lead to <sighs> fights socially further down the line that are unrelated even to these things. Um, so it is an additional thing to worry about, um, is making sure that people are treated fairly. Not not in a way that they are getting things checked and passed without any um, consequence for failing weapons or letting things pass through just because you want to be their friends or whatever. Um, but this requires a certain level of having your ear to the ground and picking up on people's, um, you know, their body language or their facial expressions. And it can also be remedied just by saying, hey, are you satisfied with how this is ruled? And if they in most cases, say yes, then you don't have much to worry about. That's something that it can be said, but I wouldn't recommend saying it to every single person or asking that to every single person. But if you can read that on a person, then you'll be more successful because if they're walking away with a stank face and angry, you could address that situation instead of having to address it later. Um, and that's why I think leaving them satisfied is a important aspect as a checker. Um, I briefly covered it. Be consistent, no bias. Um, consistency is something that we kind of didn't touch on yet. Um, it's very difficult to main consist maintain consistency when you do checks as a checker and as somebody who's in charge of check because you have to, in many cases, rotate the people who are having their stuff checked. Um, so this is most uh, like... <laughs> seen mostly i think in red checkers and archery checkers where they're getting hit with a on the back with a red weapon and over time their backs get sore and it becomes difficult for them to consciously be consistent with how they're checking things this could lead to passing things failing and um you know failing things passing because people sometimes and i'm not saying everybody have this mentality of you know i that that didn't hurt go ahead and I, i'm doing the, the standard back checking and I'll cover that later um, but they get hit and it hurts maybe a little bit more than it normally does you could either consciously say oh no my back sore that probably does fail and it could lead to uh, or probably does pass it could lead to passing failing weapons as well um, so consistency is key if you feel like you cannot consistently um, both with bias and consideration or pain levels or body capacity um, to create a un well a consistent result, remove yourself from the situation, or in that moment, find yourself a, another place that you can actively participate in. Um, so I think consistency is an important aspect to consider as a checker. Yes, sir, Roku. So uh, as far as archery goes, the most important thing that I've learned as being head of check or a volunteer at check is when someone gives you that face and they have that question and there's that pause, look at them and say, do you want to get hit in the face with this? Yeah. So far, there has not been one person who has then like, oh, yes, yes, please. You know, it, it, it is a good reminder that our prime responsibility is safety and that we want to make sure that, hey, what would you rather have? Something that is questionable or do you just mm -hmm. want to be sure? And I suppose like for reds and stuff, do you want to get hit in the arm with that? You know, yeah. um, same thing. Absolutely something to consider when determining hit testing. Um, I am going to go uh, just say it openly is I don't often red check. I do believe in a philosophy of uh, bring a red, take a hit. 
Um, and that is basically if you bring a red to weapons check, volunteer back for at least one other red. Um, and that it will keep people cycling in. I feel the same way about archery as well as a personal by a, a personal perspective or philosophy. I don't think that you need to necessarily um, subscribe to that. Um, however, it is something to consider um, when making sure that this quality of consistency is maintained um, with people. Because if you're understaffed and you're, nobody is willing to back reds or back arrows, guess what? The fallback on that is potentially things that are past failing or failing past. Um, so something to consider when when being um, trying to be consistent. Um, all right, three things that I think should not fail for. Now this is opinion based, um, but something that I have a lot of experience in. And personally, I, as somebody who was getting things checked, feel like I was treated unfairly for or have seen people that I think have been treated fairly for. Three things that I don't think that you should fail weapons for. Things should not fail for ugly. Ugly weapons that are passing are passing weapons. If you are, and I've seen this particularly in people who build weapons themselves, if you build a weapon and you have this preferred idea of what a weapon is supposed to look like, you need to remove that bias and consider that this weapon, regardless of whether or not it looks funky, could potentially pass. And your job and responsibility is to make sure it's safety, not how cool it looks or how effective it looks. There have been plenty of weapons that I have seen come on to, to check that are heavy, but padded well enough to be able to pass that people have initially created a bias in their mind when they picked it up of, I'm not, I'm not going to like this. Um, if you feel that way, have someone else do it. That is a bias, and I think it's unacceptable in weapons checking. This also is considered for shields that might pass in all qualifications. Um, but are maybe, and this is a stretch, maybe a design of something that you are not particularly a fan of, unless it is something that is needs um, immediate uh, consideration that is potentially like racist or sexist or overly explicit sexually or something like a design or something. But if you feel some sort of bias on this, or maybe you don't like a particular unit, it does fall back onto bias. If you look at something and think it fails before you test it, unless it's something that is from construction. Um, don't fail it. Have someone else do it. Um, so yeah, that it, again, I found that that most likely happens with people who are builders and they already have this idea of what a sword is supposed to look like or a shield is supposed to look like or a spear or, or javelin. Um, and that's not necessarily the case. The th second thing is failing things for being late. Now. There is some contest. I, I think that this is reasonably contested because we do have a limited amount of people who are willing to check things. Um, if you allow everything that is late to check to pass eventually, you will have a potential shift for people to not show up to weapons check and hit like a second check because they're either lazy or they feel like the second option is more pref beats their preference. Um, even if the second check is supposed to be a smaller check. This should be done with great care and consideration and understanding with the people who are coming to you telling you that their weapons are checked but are late to check but need to be checked. I feel personally, if you see a few amount of people who are coming to you as a weapons checker or someone who has the power to check the weapons or have them checked and they are saying, hey, I need these checked and they look like passing weapons. If you don't make some sort of effort, because this could be a very minimal effort to check three swords or check one batch of arrows or something. This could make or break someone's event. The thing I like to consider is that I am often a traveler to events, sometimes drive, driving you know, 10 plus hours um, to events. There is room for error for being late. I don't feel it's your weapons checker. As a weapons checker, you should think of every single person who is late to your check as somebody who is irresponsible. I think that you should consider as them as somebody who has some level, some experience that had happened to them that has stopped them from being able to make check, but that should not mean if you have the power to do so, to stop them from using safe weapons that are passing on the field that day. Um, so that is my opinion on that. And I have that opinion um, through several experiences where um, I have had friends who have made it up late because of car trouble um, or their work asked them to stay overtime. Um, in fact, there was a situation where I knew two people who had needed arrows to be checked. And one of them I had a bias for because they were a friend of mine. And the other one was someone who I did not know. 
it was as easy as me asking the head weapons check, hey, I have, you know, this level of experience checking these things. I know how to do this. Can I, with the other you watching or not, check a few people's weapons for safety? That was allowed. I even made a short announcement if anybody else was in that situation, and we fixed that problem. It took two people whose situation was not that they were trying to abuse the system, but because some extenuating circumstance had led them to that situation, to have a satisfying time. One of those people won an archery competition, that event. They would not have been able to do that given those circumstances, and I feel that's an unfair reason to fail. Does anybody have any questions or concerns about that one? Because I feel that that opinion is potentially contested. Um, go ahead. I'm more than okay with that. If the event, not me personally, mm -hmm. if the event can allow for it. If I do not have access to tape, if I do not have access to the day's uh, uh, check stick or whatever they're using to indicate, if I do not have access to that, it is not on me mm -hmm. to go get it. Secondly, if you like, you know, I will generally, if I'm head weapons check, I have my sleeves on that say arrow dude on them. I make a point in my person to have stuff ready, but there's, but very rarely am I able to, um, am I, am I able to back depending on where I am? Um, and again, it comes down to, do I have access to the stickers? If the event mm -hmm. allows for it and says, yes, go to troll, you will find your supplies there, do what you need to do. Then I am fine mm -hmm. with it. But I am, it is once I have done, my job, I have gotten up at the time that I needed to, to run the check at the scheduled time. Beyond that, that's my time, mm -hmm. right? And, you know, I have generally have no problem doing it, but it, you know, there, there's that, there's that give and take, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I know in my mundane job, I am scheduled from here to here. Guess what? You don't own me outside of those. So, Although I do enjoy helping people enjoy their events. I have no problem, you know, hey, grab blues. There is a certain level of expectation then that, hey, let's go to troll. I'll grab a passing sticker. They can witness it. We'll get you on the field. As opposed to like, ah, uh, I don't know where, you know, this person is. I don't, that person's on the field. I have to go get them because they have access to these things. Mm -hmm. it's, it's I, as far as being a volunteer, because we are volunteers. Yeah. Uh, you know, so more of our time to help people who, you know, so. I actually think that's a fantastic point, and I'd like to touch on that a little more, actually. Um, that, that's a fantastic point that Oroku makes. Um, you cannot expect, and, and I covered it in expecting that as a check E, that these people are volunteers. Um, there are ways that you can expedite this process in a fair and safe way. You can if you have a friend handy and you need a red check that you want unbiased, instead of going, hey, can you back this red? You go, hey, I found this person who can back this red, or I have an additional hand here. Hey, I checked with so-and-so and they said it would be cool so long as it was cool with you or you were there to watch. These are, are things that you can put together, but you shouldn't necessarily expect to happen. Um, I feel there are also ways as a weapons checker, if you're in a position of uh, your job to check weapons, to make time for this. Um, you can do like a Roku said and have like a sleeve or some indicator that makes you easier to find. Um, and you can express it. You can, you can say that to people, Hey, I'm available from this time, this time, if you find me, I actually have an example that happened at battle for the ring, um, where some people came to me because they had purchased arrows later on in the event. This was several hours past weapons check had already closed and they brought arrows to me and they said, Hey, I need these checked. But these people were being incredibly rude as if it was my responsibility to make sure that these things passed way past this time. And this is part of the give and take here. If you are approaching these people who can help you in these situations, it's best not to act entitled to these things. Um, in this case, they were failing arrows, which was additionally kind of a hard uh, addition to that because it wasn't as easy as oh yeah that looks good let's hit somebody with it it was this fails for this this and this and somebody who was already feeling um, entitled to have their weapons pass ended up not having them pass um, 
so so yeah, I think that there's a bunch of press time, uh, prep time that can be added to these scenarios that can um, help them. For weapons check for Battle for the Ring, I allocated an additional hour after weapons check where all the volunteers were gone, um, but I stayed at a table waiting for people to either come pick up things for impound, uh, from impound to explain to them why things failed, um, or for last minute checkers, um, which can be done, not necessarily a responsibility, but you can prep for those things as a checker before the event or set a plan for it. Does anybody have additional questions or anything on the, uh, actually I have one more don't. Uh, there's like a war college thing going on. Okay. Yeah, you can you can stay, I'm uh, welcome, um, Evan. I'm talking about uh, the do's and don'ts of weapons check or a guide to weapons check in Belagarth. Um, a lot of it is uh, uh, opinion based. Uh, we're actually gonna get into our segment of checking weapons. Um, but I might actually just end up linking that video because it does a really good job, honestly. Um, so the last thing as far as failing things is failing things that are um, easily fixable. So as a weapons checker, there is a certain level of consent that needs to be gained. You cannot, in most cases, I wouldn't advise adjusting or fixing anybody's weapons unless you have expressed consent sorry, consent from the owner of those weapons. Um, if I think that my buddy's going to be cool with it, that's a judgment call that in most cases you shouldn't make. Um, I've been in situations where I adjusted a, uh, a buddy of mine's pommel and they weren't happy about it. Um, I didn't ask them for their their content, uh, sorry, I keep saying that, consent in that situation, um, and I should have. As a weapons checker, and this could be a pro of the DMV style uh, check, there are very minor things that can be fixed on a weapon with a little bit of tape. Um, and those are things that you can ask the consent or advise for these people, hey, if you fix this, it'll take less than 30 seconds, I'm willing to wait, and then get it checked. Um, but I don't think that you should fail things in a situation where you can speak to the person whose weapon it is in that moment, that can be easily fixed. If you are in like a weapons check DMV style and somebody is there right in front of you and you say, hey, this pommel is slightly too small, you need to go back to the end of the line. I think that is something that if given just an extra minute, you can remedy right then and there. And there are other examples of this. Um, a lot of it are template issues that I think can be easily fixed by adding a little bit of foam and a little bit of tape. Um, and in my weapons check bag, which I keep, um, I keep a little bit of foam and a little bit of tape. Um, examples of this could be, hey, this is, is this stab legal? Because it's got a plush tip and you can feel it just by construction test. Yeah, it's stab legal. Hey, this doesn't have any green tape. As a weapons checker, you could in your bag have a little bit of green tape. And that extra little bit that you can do to supply somebody with a very quick and easy fix could mean that you have gone above and beyond and left somebody more satisfied. Um, this goes into you know the bonds of building social ties with people. Uh, they could be be friends for you know a positive way for helping them out. Um, this could be, you know, people who have more positive opinions of the check because something minor that could have been a a fail became a, a, a very quick pass. Um, and I think that that's something to consider when you're failing things that could be easily fixed. If it can be remedied and you have the supplies to do so, don't be a dick, give them a couple seconds to, to fix it. Um, and really the, the, the premise of all three of those things is that a little effort can go a long way as a checker, um, especially if you have the resources available to do so. Um, we have two more of this, and then I'm going to go into a little bit of a philosophical uh, opinion of mine. Um, so the next thing is giving clear explanations um, of why things fail. Um, and this comes with a little bit of a requirement, a prerequisite. If you know the Book of War well, um, and you know the rules well. If you're familiar with the construct of weaponry in itself, um, if you have that experience, that's going to lead for you to be a better weapons checker. Um, so knowing the rules is going to be not necessarily an absolute requirement in, like I said before, in uh, positions that require less experience in like piled weapons checks, um, that's going to help you dramatically. Um, if you feel that you don't know the rules, don't go in and make decisions as if you do. Um, 
brush up on them. And there's plenty of ways you can do that. If you are a person who wants, thinks that they're very confident in the, the rules, um, that in knowing the rules, I not challenge you, but I advise you to go take the presidential marshal exam. That's something that can very clearly and very easily give you an identification as somebody who knows the rules. That does, and to touch on that, that is not always an indication that you know every rule. Just because you think you know them doesn't necessarily mean you know them. If you have any doubt or hesitation or you have to contest, pull up your book of war. We keep a book of war in Korriban's, um, like a printed one um, in Korriban's uh, weapons check pal. Uh, kits yeah um and that's something that can be very quickly done i have an app on my phone that i use very quickly if i don't know the rules or if i even like i'm talking to my buddies and be like hey i think that this is the case no i think that this is the case oh guess what we have a book of war that's something that you can keep on you and you can check um when i was studying for my exam i think i read it every day like three or four times and it's definitely helped me um have a better understanding of the rules um so that's another way that it can help you give clear explanation um something that i i don't think is a very hard boundary on what I said before about um, the three things that you shouldn't fail things for, um, but a little softer here. Don't fail things for rule zero um, if you don't have to. Um, if there is a clear thing that this fails for, tell them that that's why it fails. And that's part of understanding the rules. If it is a rule zero, and for those of you at home who don't know rule zero, um, in summary, it is a way that you can fail things that are not directly covered by the Book of War. Um, do you know the rule specifically offhand, Roku? Rule zero, the, or commonly referred to as rule zero? Um, so rule zero actually is, in fact, a dagger here thing. Yeah, um, I, and, and that's, that's it's why it's a... Or whatnot. Generally, it just falls under, in Belgrade, we just generally say weapons check is discretion. Yeah, or weapons check or discretion. I think that the... Uh, there's a line that is often quoted. I'll link it instead of wasting time right now. Um, but yeah, if, if instead of failing for, I don't think this is, this is safe. If you have the opportunity and you are capable of citing a specific rule to the person in front of you, it's going to add to the communication between the two of you. And instead of that person saying, I think that person just made a call you know, uh, I don't like this. There's less bias because there is a specific rule that is being quoted when failing these weapons. Um, so that is something to consider um, when you are failing these weapons and giving clear explanation um, in that sense. Um, know the rules. That being said, if there is something that isn't just like specifically outlined by the rules and you feel it doesn't meet safety requirements, um, make the call or have a second opinion. There'll likely be someone there. Don't fail for weird. I have an anecdote for you guys. Uh, and I couldn't at that time find a reason to fail something. I didn't like it, um, but it was weird. And um, I'd never seen it before. Someone came to uh, the event and they had a Bluetooth radio in the pommel of their weapon. Um, it was well padded. It was not affixed to the core by any way that I could see. There was an outlet for charging this Bluetooth radio, but it was embedded in a way that I felt after hitting myself several times that it was safe. Um, there, It was covered. They had additional way to cover that and to take it off to display that this exists and to access it, of course. Of course. And they even showed me how it worked. Um, in every single way possible, I couldn't find a specific rule outlining that stopped this person from including this item into their pommel. I, if I was a different person and I subscribe to failing things because they're weird or things that I have not seen, I would have failed it based on it just being weird. Um, that's not something that I think that a checker should fail things for. Um, and if you're put in a situation like that, I advise that you either make, try to make a call um, based on safety or playability um, or get a second opinion from someone that you trust and is non-biased. Um, I think it's a very cool thing. I've never seen anything quite like it before. Um, I don't remember the person's name, but if I do, I'll show you guys a picture if I can find one. Um, but yep, a working Bluetooth radio inside of a palm. It was small. It wasn't like very large or anything to paint you guys a picture. There's a question that has to be asked. Yes. What did he say through that speaker? I, I honestly don't remember. Um, I think I was more dumbfounded by 
what I was looking at um, to remember the specific music. I do remember he had very good garb. Uh, it was very unique. Uh, I'm not going to reveal anything else, but I do think it was it was definitely one of those things that I will always remember as a weapons checker. And I'm very happy I made the decision to judge it based on safety, not based on it being obscure. Um, and this actually leads a little bit into flow, um, what you had asked at the beginning of the class of exotic weapons. <sighs> I am a stick jock, but yeah, that's the truth. I'm a stick jock. Um, I'm not necessarily super proud of it, but it is something that is probably accurately defines me. Um, my bats are almost all omnidirectional. They weigh about 12.1 ounces. If they're not 12 ounces on the nose, um, I have a kit that I feel that is hyper meta for my body type, as well as my fighting style. Um, I will use a very specific down to the calculations of, of length, weight, and balance for most of my gear. Um, and I don't use obscure exotic stuff. That being said, this falls under the line of a uh, realm leader. Um, from, from my experience as a realm leader, you should always include things that are going to include people. If you find people in your realm, and this is an aside because it's not necessarily relevant to the topic wholeheartedly, if you find people in your realm that like fighting with giant hammers or they like using these bust cloud buster swords or whatever, um, oh, that, flow, uh, that's flow's hammer. Um, these weapons are passing in most cases. They are absolutely safe to use and a bias given onto them for them being ugly or for them not setting or meeting a standard that you're like wanting. Um, judge them to your best ability on safety first. And then, the, well, actually in, in, let's say the order of operations here is if you were going to base it off a construction test before you're going to hit yourself, if you thought it looks unsafe, don't have tested really at all. But um, if it meets all the specifications, this is when knowing the rules is going to benefit you. Um, if it meets all the specifications, it passes and it passes for hit. You're not going to use the sword. That person is going to sword, weapon, quarterstaff, whatever. You're not going to use it. They're going to use it. It's up to them at that point to use it. You shouldn't express your bias of being a stick jock onto other people's weapons. Falls on the same line as being ugly. However, you should be open to parameters that are, and this is a potentially contested opinion. Rules change. Our system is a very int very awesome system. I think it's one of my favorite things. I've only experienced part of it. In fact, Oroku is going to, uh, uh, yeah, he'll, he'll be here too. Uh, but Oroku, you've been in this game longer and you have seen different rule changes throughout the game, I imagine. And these things change differently based on people experiencing, experimenting and play testing things to meet either new technology or uh, accessibility to, to materials, um, changes on the meta as far as how things are fought, um, as well as people just experimenting things and playtesting things. If something is brought to you that is weird and is maybe playtested, that maybe it doesn't meet all the requirements. And this is one for more of like a local weapons check than a national weapons check, because my opinion on this personally changes a little bit. Um, but if this is your realm and you have a player that just brought in a weapon that meets all the safety requirements, but is maybe a little more obscure, you on a local field have the up and down as a, like uh, the yes or no on things like this. In my opinion, I'm open to new weapons that are maybe not necessarily the standard of weapons coming on the field so long as they're safe. Um, and the people who are there fighting against are aware that this thing exists. Um, I give an example of a Madu. A Madu is potentially a, a contested uh, or like a, you know, a hard conversation topic. A Madu, for those of you who don't know what that is, um, it is a shield and it, it has one or two blades attached to the top and bottom typically of the weapon. Um, this is a weapon that is play, played with in other games. Um, if somebody brought a Madu to my field and other people thought that it was reasonable for them to spar with on the side, I would allow that. 100% I would allow it. Unless I thought that there was some reason for it to fail as far as safety. Now, in comparison to a larger event where there is more people being affected by your decision to allow weapons like this onto the field, that decision becomes much harder. If I were to do it at Bifter or something, I likely would not allow a Madu on the field. 
I'd spar you off to the side for like private fights or something because I think that's fascinating. But it's up to you as a checker in that situation to make the call. If you as a weapon builder or someone who wants experimental or exotic weapons to be added to the Book of War, talk to your realm leaders or your local war console representatives in order to make those changes because they can be changed. A weapon that is safe and is playable but does not meet the rules can have the rules changed if it is found to be safe and playable. Um, so those are things to heavily consider when... Oh, you have a question, Flo? No, I was just going to say the way you went through that made you sound like a telemarketer for just, just a little bit of a second. That's that's fine with me. Uh, I, <laughs> um, representative. <laughs> well, so this is something that I actually see that I, I've seen like online people fight about is this weapon that is both safe and is for the most part playable automatically fails in a lot of people's eyes because it doesn't meet this rule specifically. Uh, and I'm being vague on this case because this can be filled in with literally anything. I had a weapon that was a quarterstaff, but was a hammer on top come onto my field. And I thought, what is this rule break for? Guess what? Cylindrical padding is what the, the freaking, sorry, the, the rules are in that. So in this case, it's a very, you know, yes, sir. So really, I mean, really quickly, as far as rule changes go, uh, in my study of them, they are actually not radical. They're very gradual. So mm -hmm. that's something to remember. And specifically, because you brought it up, that is to one rule that has been on the books since we started, which is 2.3, no single piece of equipment can be classified as both offensive and defensive equipment. Mm -hmm. Instantly, like it doesn't, playable safety, it doesn't matter. That's that's like, you know, that's one of the basics as far as that goes, so just as a note. I totally understand. And I take the philosophy of understand, trying to understand other games. So Madu is a usable weapon in another foam sport that is, you know, very closely related to us. Um, and this conversation isn't specifically about Madu's. I use that as an example of an exotic weapon. Um, but Belagarth has a luxury of not having to adhere to the Book of War in local settings or events that are not specifically hosted by, battle, by, by Belagarth, um, as well as um, you have the opportunity to potentially change the rules. Um, that can be done over time, and it's gradual. Um, but there's no reason to not propose something that you have playtested to be found and safe. So if you talk to your realm leader or war council representative and something isn't quite the rules, but is safe and potentially playable, play test it and see where it goes. Um, so that's my philosophy on exotic weapons and potentially failing by the rules, but not necessarily in um, safety, um, because there are a lot of innovations that have been made to weapons that at some point may have been failing. Actually, Oroku, I have a question for you. Certainly. I need to run outside. We've got a Santa Claus that's flying around in the sky, so I'm going to go try to see it. But yes. Okay. Uh, tape on weapons. When did it happen? It happened um, before I started. It happened with the rewrite, and it was actually, well, it happened briefly before the rewrite. That was actually Warmaster Hakan who really pushed that. I'd uh, love to shake his hand. I'm going to shake his uh, hand next time I see him. Tape saying that, no, that's stupid. Like, it needs to go through hit test. If it passes hit test, then there's no reason to say that it, you know, that uh, that rule should be changed. There's a really good thread on the boards about that. Um, if I, I find it, I will shoot it to you. And you can please. actually see all of the arguments that were put up for it, which is why I researched my rules, not just what the rules are, but where they come from, because that can give you a really good idea of how that works. Wonderful. All right. Thank uh, you. I'm going to step outside. If I'm not back before this is over, thank you all for doing this. Um, and this is a note. Uh, Carps, we should set up just a private Zoom at some point and chat for an a hour or two. That'd be absolutely. Great. We can do that. Thank all you. Right. Um, so uh yeah so tape on weapons tape on weapons is something that was new to when i started i started oh, sorry it was right before i started from what i understood when i started um and i started about seven years ago what i mean by tape on weapons is not tape on the handles or tape on the pommels i mean tape on the blades of weapons so long as the weapons are fabric covered that is a new er er rule um and if any weapon prior to that had tape on it it was a failing weapon so and I mean, this plays to, to the idea of rules or laws in general, but if things are illegal and then become legal, the, the change was people making that change, you know, and proposing it and testing it and making it happen. Um, so I encourage all of you to safely change the rules. That's a power that we have as realms. Um, and that's my personal philosophy on that. Um, oh, 
uh, be open, be aware of it, um, and have your ear to the ground. Rules change not super quickly, but they do. So if you think that you know every rule and you haven't paid attention to the boards, then maybe you're missing it. You know what I mean? All right. Does anybody have any questions so far in the meeting? No, because this is my time for uh, questions. I'm going to go over my weapons check bag. I'm going to go downstairs and we're going to go on a field trip. Um, and then we'll go from there. Okay. Um, I do got a bill for dinner, but it has been very informative. Absolutely. Um, thank you. Actually, um, the rest of this video is covered very clearly in another video that I recommend super heavily. It's 16 minutes long. It's edited so you don't get any of the ums that I'm giving you um, or or the little you know breaks for clarity and stuff. So uh, I'll link that video and I recommend everybody watch it. That covers the more defined book of war, how to measure it, everything. I'm going to do that right now. But yeah, those of you who have to go, feel free. Okay. It was good having you. If you guys have any questions, those of you who are leaving, um, feel free to ask me literally whenever. Facebook. I know. Okay. All right. Field trip time for those that are here. Are there people who are still here? I'm here. I'm not on camera, but I've been watching and listening. Nice. Um, I'm very happy to have you guys. I'm here too. Still watching. With you. you guys think I'm full of a bunch of hot air or have I taught you guys something? Hopefully. <laughs> I feel like I learned a lot. I nice. Like it tracks. It tracks. Nice. <laughs> okay, so here is uh, the armory in Castle Onderol. There is lots of weapons, and I'm gonna maybe, hopefully, there you go. You got a bunch of them right here. <sighs> Firstly, I'm going to show you guys what's in my weapons check kit. So hopefully, this is clear. We went on a field trip, so um, no worries. Can you guys hear me all right? Yes. Yes, okay. Um, I'm actually gonna leave you for a second. I'll be right back. Give me a minute, actually. I know exactly what I'm getting. This class took a field trip and then our instructor abandoned us. We went out to go get cigarettes and will not come back. <laughs> oh, hi. <laughs> I lied. I'm a fraud. Um, but I do have a backup. So I'll just my backup. Yes. 
Hello. So I'm going to go over the things that I keep in my weapons kit. Kit. And in fact, I'm also going to use an additional resource that I can give to every single one of you is Corbans. Let me read it specifically. Corban Pollux and Tournaments Checklist. Um, specifically, I have the Weapons Check and Tournaments Check Kit. Um, this was a list that was created by Square Pet. I found it incredibly helpful and it is something that I follow for my kit. Um, I recommend for those who are realm leaders to invest in a weapons checking kit. Um, they are always handy. Um, I have one personally. Um, it is property of the realm of under rules um, that I that I maintain. Um, and I'm going to go over a lot of these things. I can link this. I can't link it in chat right now, but I can link it into the event page later. So first is weapons check kit, a book of war. Um, I find my phone the most helpful. In the core band kit, we have a physical copy of the Book of War. I went over previously why that is important. The next of which is a ruler. I like to use a measuring tape. The reason why I like a measuring tape is for red weapons and for spears, you'll find a lot of pole arms. Can't really be done very well with a, you know, a little ruler or a yardstick. So this is coming especially handy. It's also very handy for measuring out your area um, to create solid and uh, very structured area for you to, to do weapons check. So very handy tool, one of my favorites for this is The next of which is a bow poundage gauge. Um, these can, are available on Amazon. Um, they're very easy to use. I actually don't have a bow available. I didn't even think about that. Um, but they're effectively held right here by two fingers and um, attached to the string here. There we go. What did you link? That is tape on weapons. Nice, thank you. I will definitely read that. Um, so that very easily, I, and I'd show you on a bow to be honest with you. And I'll do it later. Buying one of these, please buy something designed for bows. Please don't show up with fish scales or luggage scales or anything else. Please show up with a proper bow scale. Thank you. Wonderful, and it's very good to keep a proper one in your bag. Um, definitely read reviews wherever you're purchasing them. You can purchase them from archery stores. Um, I this I got mine off Amazon. Um, pass stickers and failing stickers are important things to keep in bags. These are more relevant for larger weapon um, weapon checks. At Onderoll, we do like we try to keep up with bi monthly um, like uh, official checks. Um, so we'll just get everybody's and we'll check them. Um, mostly we do self checks or like spot checks just to be sure if we see anything failing. Or we use our best judgment um, at Onderoll, but. Uh, if it's a smaller event or a day event, um, stickers can still be used. Um, in fact, we use them. We've got, I think these ones, we have a bunch of these as an example. Um, weapons check stickers can be, I don't like stick on stuff, um, but I have seen a lot of very success with the little dots, little the dot stickers. Um, but for weapons, I'll show you an example of one that's been through a lot of checks. This has a bunch of passing stickers on them. Um, often, if you're running a multi-day event, it's good to have multiple different passing stickers. That way, it doesn't look like it's been checked, even though it was checked a day earlier, you know? Um, or failing stickers as well. I have to dig around for mine, um, but we have ones that say, this weapon failed because, and then you can write it on it. Um, you could also... <sighs> I don't like to use like a different one for failing stickers for smaller events. For larger ones, I like to have ones that you can write on. Um, but for smaller events, I find it better to just communicate one on one with the person if it's like a a realm day event or something, or if it's like under fifty people um, communicating with them why something failed is the route I go. But not necessarily the one you have to go. Um, stickers aren't very expensive. Um, a loaner weapon bag. Wait, no, I'm sorry. That is not. Oh, the loaner weapon bag is on our list, um, but it is not specific to weapons check. It's on this core band list um, because it is, I find it is important, and I covered that earlier, to have backup weapons as a realm leader for members of your realm who are not well versed or maybe have equipment that is secondhand if their stuff fails um, to have as a backup. So we keep our loaner weapons um, as well. Um, Um, so another thing that we keep, which I find is important, is caution tape. We use caution tape 
um, but really any sort of way to partition off areas at your weapons check is going to be an important thing to keep in your bag. Um, you can keep a, a 50 foot strand of rope, or if you're consistently doing it at the same field, you can always just do like specific cuts and you can tag them with a piece of tape or something and write on this is the blue one and this is that. That comes with time if you're consistently running your events to prep for those things. Um, but I like caution tape. It's also yellow and very easy if the wind doesn't pick it up um, to pick up so you're not littering at your park. Um, I'm sure I have left rope that is brown on the ground at a park and I feel bad about that. Um, so I would advise against something or advise for something bright so you're not littering in public parks. Um, caution tape can be a little tricky because it's light and it can be picked up by the wind. Um, so we use golf tees often um, to, to stake down like one, two, three, four, and just make sure you grab your one, two, three, four golf cue tee. Warning tickets is something we keep in our weapon bag, our weapons check bag. Um, not necessary specifically for weapons check, um, but if you need or doing like a ticket, ticket, leave a ticket kind of system, um, standard tickets will apply. Um, what are additional things? Uh, one thing that I keep that I find is very important, so probably one of the more important ones is a scale. Um, it's important while knowing the rules to understand um, the weights of various weapons. Um, so for Omnis, or sorry, I say Omnis, I'm so used to it, uh, blue swords, uh, minimum weight measurement on that is going to be 12 ounces, um, unless it is under 24 ounces. Uh, in which case there is no minimum in that case. Uh, but it is important as a weapons checker, if you see or you feel like a weapon might be light, give it a double check. This is especially true with reds who have a, um, a minimum weapon uh, weight requirement and is often like, well, blues and reds, I find this is what you're needing them for. Um, javelins too, but definitely something handy. Um, this is a digital kitchen scale. I like these, they're very inexpensive. You can get them off Amazon. And so long as you have a flat surface, like a table, or you can make one best your abilities. Um, very important thing to have in your kit. Something I covered, well, actually I'll do this one first. This is a great investment. These are 3D printed um, weapon checking templates. These cover a wide variety of different things. Um, Oh, could you bring me a piece of weapon or piece of armor when you go back upstairs? I appreciate it. Um, so these are very inexpensive. Um, I got mine from Cassius Apparel. Um, Cassius makes them, I think I paid like $15, $20 for them. They're very good quality. Um, and these ones have all the numbers on them. This is very cool. Um, these, uh, I think these are cross, this is a cross game template. So it includes additional measurements that aren't necessarily necessary for our game. Um, but it, it requires a, both templates, both the pommel and the stab tip. The stab tip is two and a half inches and ruling on that is it must not pass a half inch through this um, on its own accord. So you wouldn't twist in and I'll give an example of that. Um, and then pommels are the same thing here, but it's two inches. Um, this is also true for, um, I, I don't wanna call it failing templates when you have things like, well, I don't have anything that fails template, I hope. Um, but if you have a cross guard specifically and it can poke a kid's eye out or something or somebody's eye out or on a shield or something, this is something that you'll also be using for template. Um, these are often six inches, which is going to be the minimum, sorry, the maximum for flails. Um, thank you. I need this one. I appreciate it. This is a maximum for flails. Um, these will be printed at six inches. Uh, I have a flail here. Watch it fail. <laughs> If you have this here, this should not exceed, the chain foot length should not exceed this. So this is a very handy tool to have because it will have a multi-function here. Um, there's also a tab here, which I recommend, that will check the gauge of armor. I don't have that number offhand, I'm sorry. But you see, here's an example where this will not fit here. So this is acceptable. Uh, I find it's not necessary in most cases to go throughout the entire depth of the armor so long as it's uh, passing here. And that can be layered up twice too. Uh, I'm not gonna go over every single rule in the Book of War. That's why I asked optionally if you wanted to include the Book of War while we were going over things. 
I think that that is everything that I keep. In oh, one more thing. One more concept, I guess. I keep various tapes in my weapons check kit. Um, I keep yellow, green, red, blue is not normally an issue. Um, but if you wanted to add that, you're welcome to. I keep packing tape and I keep carpet tape in my weapons check bag. This goes over the philosophy that I previously went over was if you have the access to have someone fix it quickly, you can. If it is a tip issue or something, they go back and then they come back to you or something and they have it fixed, you can check it without there being too much consequences for it if you have things available to you. This is not a necessary thing. However, I think this is a good courtesy to give to your players. Um, you can be prepared so they don't have to by accident. Um, so they don't have to be prepared accident, un, unprepared accidentally. You can do it for them if you have access. This can save a lot of people. Um, and that's my philosophy on it. Yellow, green, red. Packing tape, carpet tape. The one thing I do not have here, which I should have is athletic tape. I probably used it. <laughs> um, but athletic tape is another very easy thing that you can do to fix weapons or offer players who are looking for it. Um, be helpful, you know? Thank you. I also keep a, a small cut of blue foam in my, um, in my bag. As a reference for my bag size, I have a bag that looks like this. It's clear so I can look at it and go, hey, that's in that bag. This is a very helpful thing actually, because uh, when you're doing weapons check, a lot of your stuff will be kind of scattered because someone will be using this and someone will be using that. Um, if you're able to look at a bag quickly and effectively be able to go, hey, that's in there, save you time and effort, trust me, I think. And this was by accident, but I absolutely think that this is one of the best features of a bag like this. Um, it's also good because you can go, hey, that's my weapons check bag. What's our time looking at? 554. Okay. Um, so as much as I really want to check all these weapons, I'm not going to check all my weapons today in front of you guys. Um, I instead will link a video that is on the Bellagarth Medieval Combat Society's YouTube page. Um, forgive me if I mispronounce the person's name, but their name is uh, Kaleida, I believe. Um, and I'll link that. That one's very clear and it goes through every single weapon. Um, so and it's only 16 minute long and very edited. I recommend it. Uh, before we wrap up, is there any other questions at all that anybody has that they would like to ask that I can clear up today? I think I think I might have one. Um, the, the all too important question, how do you say no to a person or at least how do you how do you talk to like the tough customers and the rules lawyers um kind of like the i guess the public relations angle of, of weapons checking so i have two answers for your question um i'm doing to do it one from the perspective of head of check and how to prepare for that and then second i'm going to um well probably i'm gonna say this first firstly I covered it briefly of being clear and communicative. Um, if you can cite a rule, cite a rule. Um, that comes with knowing the rules or having the rules handy and going to them. Um, people, people will have more of a trouble fighting you if you can tell them clear and concise why this fails. And if it's something that is very easy to fix, I allow, I allow them to fix it so long as it's not going to be a lot of work on my end if I don't need, uh, if I have more things I need to worry about. Does that make sense for the first part? Yeah, yeah. Uh, sorry, so, I, I muted myself. As you can hear, there's a little bit going on in the background. <laughs> the second part of that is something that I did and I really liked. Um, as head weapons check, I had a person whose job was to give the hard news to people who were having trouble with it. Um, they were somebody who were specifically very, very uh, well-versed in the rules. They were somebody who I trusted to be able to deliver an unbiased opinion. Um, and they were a second, uh, like a second opinion for me. It was almost like uh, someone to grant me authority when somebody was doubting or questioning mine. Does that make sense? I had a friend who came up and said, 
I said, hey, what do you think about this? I think this. And they said, you know what? I agree with that. And it granted me a level of authority that was able to clear up the situation um, without those people getting really mad. Yeah, like a like an official second opinion almost. Yes. I had someone who was my dedicated second opinion. And if they were in a situation, I was their dedicated second opinion. Awesome. That answers my question. And uh, thank you again for hosting this. I apologize. I only caught the, I think the last half of it. I think it went well and I will be posting this recording to our YouTube channel once it is posted in February. Wonderful. Looking forward to it. I'm muting Good. myself now. <laughs> thank you. Um, does anybody else have any questions or comments before we wrap up the class? Going once, going twice. All right. In conclusion, I would like for you guys to use this information and any, any additional information that I give alongside this video um, to better yourselves as well as the other people who are interested. Um, go ahead and if you have a friend who this might be helpful for, link them this video. Um, the ultimate goal here is to be fair uh, and to leave your people satisfied. And that same accord, if you are a checkee, Make sure that you're being treated fairly. And if you are not, talk to somebody who can help the situation. Um, yeah. Thank you all for attending so much. There are more. Uh, I'm going to stop the recording now. Thank you all for attending so much. Um, stop.